In the last video, we defined ecology as the study of the distribution of organisms and their interaction with the physical and biological environment. And we also looked at the research questions that an ecologist might ask. So today, what I want to do is go on and discover the rules of ecology. These are what I think are the most important things you need to know about ecology. So let's get started. First, all organisms need energy to survive. Now, in order to understand this, the first thing we have to ask is, what is energy? And to do so, we go to the discipline of physics, where we find out that energy is the ability to do work. And work is the ability to exert a force over a distance. And so that means for our purposes, energy is the ability to exert forces. Organisms use energy to carry out chemistry, to carry out chemical reactions. And chemistry is the study of the formation and destruction of chemical bonds. So organisms use energy to destroy and create molecules. And these are the molecules that are necessary to keep a cell alive and functioning. Now, there's a funny fact about energy, and it's one that is true so far as we know. And that is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It simply changes forms from one form to another. And this has a very important implication. It means that all things that require energy must constantly acquire energy. Let's just talk about the changing of forms of energy for a second. When you burn wood, the energy is transformed from chemical energy to heat energy. And you might be saying, well, where did the wood get it from? Well, the wood got it from the light energy from the sun. And we could keep going backwards to find where each energy source came from, and we'd eventually get to the beginning of the universe. And we can't look farther back than that. This observation about energy is so important. It's called the first law of thermodynamics. And so you should memorize that. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. As a human being, we consume food, which contains energy, and we convert some of the energy in that food into ATP. And ATP is known as the energy currency of the cell. The energy in the ATP is then used by the body to carry out the processes of life. As a result, the human body produces chemical waste, carbon dioxide and water, and it produces heat, which is waste energy that flows out into the environment and is no longer useful. And we'll have more to say about that and think about that idea much more later. How does life get energy? Well, there are organisms called energy transducers, and these are able to convert energy from one form, an inanimate form, to a form that is stored in the cell. In other words, it's animate energy. It makes living tissue, and that living tissue is energy-rich. There are two kinds of energy transducers. Some, like these pictured over here on the right side of the screen, are bacteria that use the energy found in minerals or chemicals in the soil, in the seafloor, in a cave, something like that, to make cells. Others use light energy from the sun. And currently, these are the most important energy transducers in most ecosystems on Earth. But they weren't always. We think that these kinds of organisms over here, these chemical-eating bacteria, were the original life forms. All other organisms get their energy by eating an organism. So it's only the transducers that don't need to eat another organism. And this, of course, suggests two categories to group life into. The producers, which are the energy transducers, and the consumers, which are the ones that eat other things. In scientific terms, we call the producers autotrophs because they can feed themselves. They autotroph versus the heterotrophs, which are the consumers, that have to feed on others. And within autotrophs, we define the two kinds we saw up here as chemoautotrophs. In other words, they feed themselves on chemicals versus photoautotrophs they feed themselves on light. That's all vocabulary that you should know now, and it should be pretty obvious why these things are called what they are, and these long words that you might think are difficult, 
Now that you know what they are, they should be much easier. Chemo autotrophs, chemical self feeders, photo autotrophs, light self feeders. So now it's time to play a game. Autotroph or heterotroph. I'm going to show you a picture, explain it, and you're going to tell me whether it's an autotroph or a heterotroph. Here goes. Here is a fern. Uh, relatives of this fern grow on the walls of the metro station deep underground. I don't know how they do it, but they do. Is this a heterotroph or an autotroph? Yell really loud so I can hear you, okay? You all probably said that this was an autotroph. Very good. What about this tortoise here? What's this tortoise? If you need to stop the video to think about it, do so. Yes, you got it right. It's a heterotroph. What about this Venus flytrap plant here? This thing, which is currently consuming a wasp. What is that? Confusing, huh? It's an autotroph. It's green. It doesn't get energy from this wasp that it's consuming. It's going to get mineral nutrition, but not energy. It still gets its energy from photosynthesis. And finally, what about this green chameleon? Is it a heterotroph or an autotroph? What do you think? If the green color caused you to think it's photosynthesizing, guess again, this thing is a heterotroph. It eats lots of things, especially insects. Since plants are the most important autotroph for current ecosystems, we need to talk about their nifty trick, which is photosynthesis. And plants have this molecule that can capture energy in sunlight. It captures that energy and puts it into the molecule. And this is a really rare thing to happen. No animal and most bacteria cannot do it. They don't possess a molecule like this. And the captured energy, then, is used to make what I like to call the building block molecules, or the BBMs. You should learn that as a term, because I'm going to be using that over and over. That's a vocabulary word now. And the BBMs are necessary to make the four kinds of huge macromolecules of life. And you should think right now, ask yourself, what are the four macromolecules of life? What are the four kinds of macromolecules of life? See if you can figure out what those are. I'm not going to tell you now. We'll come back to it later. In photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water, which are taken up from the environment, are combined using the energy of sunlight to make sugar. And here's what it looks like. Carbon dioxide plus water uses the energy and light to make carbohydrates and oxygen. And sugar is a kind of carbohydrate. If we wanted a more exact chemical formula, here it is. Six carbon dioxide and six water are combined using light energy that is captured by chlorophyll into one molecule of glucose and six molecules of oxygen. Now, guess what the sugar contains? If you said it contains some of the energy that was in the light, give yourself a big pat on the back because that's exactly right. The sugar contains energy. And it would be good for you to memorize this equation exactly, this form of it, as well as conceptually, this form of it. Those two things you will need to know for this course. So remember, what this equation says, WTES, inanimate carbon dioxide and inanimate water are converted into glucose and oxygen. The glucose is inside a living cell. The glucose, then, can be used to do two things. It can be used to make other molecules needed by the cell. In other words, it provides a molecular skeleton on which to build other molecules. Or it is an energy source. It is chopped up and the energy is extracted from it. Indeed, we should all hail photoautotrophs because we would not be here without them. And we should probably be worshiping plants. Now, one last thing. Chlorophyll is the molecule that captures energy in sunlight. And how important is this molecule? Well, it is green in color. So this green flower, this green stem, and this green thing I call the cactus, which isn't, which has no leaves, are all photosynthesizing. And when you look at plants and you look at the world, there is a lot of green because everything's photosynthesizing. All the plants are photosynthesizing. Once you have the sugar, how does the energy in it actually get used? Well, it must be burned or combined, chemically combined, with oxygen in this way. Glucose and oxygen are combined chemically to make 
carbon dioxide, and water, and specifically one glucose and six oxygen are combined to make six carbon dioxide and six water, and heat energy is given off. Does this equation look familiar to you? It should, because it's the exact opposite of photosynthesis. This equation is referred to as cellular respiration, or maybe I should say cellular respiration can be summarized as this equation, and you should memorize this as well. That should be a pretty easy task once you have photosynthesis down because it's just the opposite process. And here's an important point and something that beginning students often get wrong. All cells, with a very few exceptions, can do cellular respiration even if they can photosynthesize. Yes, plants, in order to utilize the energy in sugar, have to do cellular respiration. Okay, now it's time for a little bit of a test and yell your answers out again once you know them. Here's the first one. What kind of organisms can do photosynthesis? Use the most exact word you can. Photoautotrophs. If you said producers, if you said autotrophs, those are good answers, but they're not great answers. Okay, what kind of organisms can do cellular respiration? Yes, almost all of them, exactly. Now, give an example of a place where you might find an autotroph that isn't a photoautotroph, in other words, where you might find a chemoautotroph. That's a tough question because we haven't discussed it. But if you said somewhere like a cave, somewhere like a hot vent under the ocean, somewhere that's really chemically very extreme, like a salt flat, you got it. You might not have known any of those places existed, so you couldn't have gotten that answer, but now you do. Give an example of a place where you would expect to find an organism that can't do cellular respiration. And the answer to that is a place where there isn't any oxygen. So, for example, ocean sediments, where there's no oxygen a few centimeters below the surface of the ocean floor, tend to be anoxic, and they would tend to have these kinds of organisms, uh, uh, organisms that don't require oxygen. So now we're on to rule two, and rule two says organisms have different roles and relationships in an ecosystem. And here are some of the most common relationships that I want you to know about. There's parasitism. And a parasite feeds on the body of another organism. In other words, it's a heterotroph, but they don't kill it. Predation is like parasitism, except the predator kills what it eats. Symbiosis is when two organisms of different species work together. They've evolved a close association with each other. In some cases, both species benefit. This occurs, for example, with the E. coli in your bacteria. They provide us with protection from disease, vitamin K. We provide them with food, warmth, and a safe environment for them to reproduce. When both species benefit, these are called mutualists. Perhaps you can think of other examples. Sometimes one benefits and the other is unaffected. And this occurs, for example, with orchids that grow on the branches of trees, the so-called epiphytes. The orchid benefits by having a place to live and being closer to the light, but the tree is not affected. It's not hurt by the orchid, but neither does it gain any benefit. And these are called commensalists. Can you think of other examples? Finally, they're competitors. Two species may have similar roles or similar needs, and thus they may compete with each other. And one may actually drive the other population to zero, which is called extirpation or local extinction. I'm going to go through these categories again, so you'll just be sure about them. Here's a parasite. This mistletoe plant puts its roots into the tree's bark and sucks out water and some of the nutrients, but it doesn't kill the tree. What effect might this have on the tree, however? Think about that. Predators, this falcon is about to consume this bee eater, which is a beautiful family of old world birds, and the predator consumes the prey, but when the prey becomes rare, the predator has to find another food source or its population will reduce. So predators have an interest in having a good sized prey population. Here are some mutualists, this cattle egret and the cow. The egret eats the insects, which benefits the cow, and the cow gets protection from annoying and perhaps dangerous insects. So they both benefit. And an interesting question for this is, how would this evolve? What's the, what are the steps in the evolution of such a relationship? And here are commensalists. Uh, we have uh, Nemo down here, 
and his dad, Marvin. And um, one species benefits, the clownfish gets protection from its enemies in the anemone. And the anemone doesn't get much from the clownfish. If you could prove that the clownfish's food also feeds the anemone, then you would show that it is a mutualism. We finally have competitors. Here are some competitors. These lions and hyenas are competing over this water buffalo kill here. And that's competition. Two species are utilizing a scarce resource, in this case, food. But competitors don't need to compete over it over food. They could compete over uh, nest sites, uh, water if you're a plant, minerals in the soil, other aspects of habitat, like just surfaces to grow on if you were things like barnacles and mussels and clams and things like that. So competitors don't need to be similar. They just need to use the same scarce resource. So that's it for today. Next time we're going to go over some more rules of ecology that have to do with these relationships between organisms and the transfer of energy between them. Until next time, think about biology, make some observations in nature, and come back to class with lots of questions. See you then.